dive back in. Let us dive back in to 2 Corinthians 11. It talks some more about Eve and the deception of Eve, specifically talking about the fact that Eve was honest. We may have been too hard on Eve in time past, and I'd like to take a look at that. Because Paul said in the third verse of 2 Corinthians 11, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and a pure devotion to Christ. And you know, if Paul was afraid, I should be afraid. And if Eve was deceived, I can be deceived too. Eve was intelligent and Eve was honest. So we're talking about the fact that she's honest today. And what is she honest about? Well, that's what we're going to talk about. But Eve knew everything that God had revealed to humankind. <laughs> All of the revelation that there was, the commandment of God in the garden to, to Adam, she knew. Uh, in fact, she knew it well enough that she even drew a necessary inference that she shouldn't touch the, the tree. She shouldn't touch the fruit of the tree. There's no need to get even near the thing. And knowing what the Bible teaches, of course, is good. It's even critical, I would say. You need to know that. We all need to know that, but it's not enough to know. That's the point of Eve is it's not enough to know what it says. She was deceived into questioning God's motives for saying what he said. So the real trick here is, you know, knowing the facts is one thing, drawing the right conclusion from those facts is another. <laughs> That's where the faith is, drawing the right conclusion from the facts. God's word presents facts. We know what it says, and now what do you do with that? How do you apply that? How do you turn that into action? That's where the faith is. Bible faith, I should say, obedient faith. The way that it works, remember, the trick of the devil is, is he doesn't actually question what God said, which was, you shall not eat of that tree, and the day you eat of it, you will die. That's not actually in question other than to say, did God really say that? That's what he said. Did God really say that? And she says, well, here's what he said. The devil doesn't say, oh, that's not what he said. That's not what the devil says. The devil said, oh, that's what he says, all right. It's true. God said not to eat the fruit of the tree, but not because you'll die. It's because he's holding out on you. He doesn't want you to become like him. So it's questioning the motives of God while giving this, you know, false impression that we respect what God said. <laughs> you know, you won't find a church in the land that doesn't affirm that, oh, the Bible, the Bible is, is God's word. Oh, the Bible is right. You won't find a church of Christ anywhere, I don't think that will say they follow anything other than the Bible as their guide in religion. But look at what they're actually doing. It's clear that the majority of people who say this are lying. They're not right. If that were true, they would be doing this. We, we have to be truthful with ourselves Eve was smarter than to miss the knot in the devil's tail when he said, oh, you'll not surely die. It's not as if she didn't notice he was contradicting the Lord. Of course she noticed that. The trick is the devil gave a rationale, an alternate explanation for why that would be said. And she found that to be convincing. That's the problem. Right, so she is doing this. I'm trying to explain that she was honestly 
deceived. She was tricked, deceived about this, but she did so honestly, as in she really did not at the time see it for what it really was. And that's the trick. Any of us could fall by that same example. We're at the time, at the moment, we're not seeing it for what it really is. We're not apprised of the situation. We're not thinking, if you will, in the way that we know ought to be done as priests of the Lord, living and providing daily sacrifices, Romans 12, 1 and 2. She was honestly deceived. And so we go to 1 Timothy 2, and we'll go back to Genesis 3 as well. But we start with 1 Timothy 2 because this is the place where Paul tells us plainly, the 13th and the 14th verses. Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. That's 1 Timothy 2, 13 and 14. So in the 13th verse, the first thing that he says is Adam was formed first, then Eve. This is saying something very specific that I believe has been missed far too often. People think that this means, oh, well, therefore, Adam outranks her. Or, uh, you know, the sequel's never as good. You know, things like this that people think as if this is meant somehow to take away from Eve or to make her less than. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is, if you look back at Genesis 2, um, when the Lord formed Adam, he told him about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's when he gave him the commandment, you shall not eat of that tree lest you die. That's Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And the 18th verse records, and then the Lord said, it's not good for Adam to be alone. I will make for him a helpmeet comparable to him. The significance of saying Adam was formed first, then Eve, is to say Adam heard the commandment directly from the mouth of God. He's the person to whom the revelation was made. He's the one who relayed that message to Eve, who, like us, is believing what God said through the mediation or through the mechanism of a messenger. She didn't hear God say this. Adam heard God say this, and he told her this is what God said. The significance of that is that it's our position. We don't hear directly from God today. We hear from those who did hear directly from God because they wrote the Bible. That's our position. We're like Eve. The second thing that I would point out there, that Adam was not deceived, the woman was deceived. Is not a matter of her intellect or her capability um, of her frame, you know, any of that kind of thing. It's just a statement of fact that Adam knew what he was doing, what they were doing together was wrong when they did it. He knew this was counter to what they had been commanded, and he did it anyway. Eve was not thinking that way at all. She was fully deceived, uh, mistaken, if you will. All it's saying is there's two different ways of doing this. Sometimes 
we know what we're doing is wrong and we do it anyway because we've decided to give ourselves over. Other times, we did something because we weren't thinking right or we weren't thinking at all. But they're both transgressors. You know, here it says that she became a transgressor in this way. Um, Romans 5.14 records that Adam also is a transgressor, and everybody who has sinned since the time of Adam is also a transgressor. So it's not like there's a distinction between them in this regard. They're both guilty. God pronounces judgment upon both. We both, men and women, have you know, the consequences of that sin in this world. But I would say to you, you know, any understanding of this passage or, uh, you know, first Peter talks about uh, showing her uh, preference as the weaker vessel. And people love to seize upon the weaker vessel. Yes, she's weaker because she doesn't have as much muscle or she's not as smart or whatever it is. None of that is true. Weaker is talking about position. Because she is subject to the husband, she is in danger if the husband does wrong. She suffers the consequences of the wrong that her husband does. That's all that it means. Weaker by position. That's all. Any understanding that makes Eve less than Adam, or women less than men, is actually arrogant and it's deadly. It's arrogant because it exalts men above women or exalts, exalts, you know, ourselves, our own intellect, our own strength, whatever, above this supposed but fake picture of a woman. It's fake. That's a lie of Satan. It's there to take advantage of your arrogance and to catch you off guard. And the, you know, the irony of that is that it's exactly how you will fall into the same trap that Eve fell into. So the thing we have to understand is I am in jeopardy. You know, I am in jeopardy. We are not better. I'm not better than Mother Eve was. I'm not smarter than she was. I'm not more honest than she was, you know. That's the thing that needs to be understood, I think. And so we want to make that point fairly clearly before moving on to Genesis 3. But back in Genesis 3, we're going to continue with the idea that you have a stark contrast being drawn by Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures. There's a stark contrast between Adam and Eve. The nature of Adam's sin and the nature of Eve's sin. That contrast is not whether they're guilty. They're both guilty. Contrast is not whether they suffer consequences for that. No, they both do. Or whether they lose their souls. No, they both do lose their souls, at least at that moment. The contrast is Adam knew what he was doing when he did it. Eve did not see it for what it really was. This is about, well, intentions, I suppose. And the scriptures actually do address intentions. That's what we need to talk about because that's where the, the uh, deception comes in. First, we look at Adam in Genesis 3. It's verses 9 through 11. But what we're finding here in Genesis 3, 9 through 11 is that, that something that we're going to point out that the way God asks questions, the questions that he asks of Adam are different from the question that he asks of Eve. And the difference between those questions is exactly this. He's asking Adam questions that pertain to rebellion, open rebellion. He's asking Eve questions that pertain to understanding because Adam knew what he was doing. Eve was deceived. So God's questions to Adam reflect rebellion. The ninth verse, the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? <laughs> right? Did this go where you thought it was going to go, Adam? 
No. <laughs> and he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? See, where are you? Is saying, did this go where you thought it was going, Adam? Are you glad that, that, that you decided to cross that line? How are things outside of the boundaries? That's what that's saying. Who told you you were naked means I have the evidence that you have the knowledge that was gotten by that tree. You didn't know that until you ate the tree. I know that you ate the tree because you know that you're naked and you wouldn't. And finally, have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? That question, have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? What are the correct responses to a question formed this way? Yes and no. <laughs> have you eaten of the tree? Yes or no, right? That's the only way to answer that question, honestly. But that's not how Adam answered that question, if you recall. That's not how he answered that question, but we will deal with him later. What he's saying is, you walked away from me, Adam. Where did it lead? You need to take responsibility for rebelling. You need to be honest, because you've not been honest. That's what he's saying. But if you look at the 13th verse, the question to Eve is, the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? You understand that question? <laughs> it's not that God is angry and turns in a flash of anger to, you know, chew her out with, oh, what is this you've done? What are you doing? You know, no, that's not what's happening. The question is, Eve, do you get it now? What is this? Do you see this for what it is now? Do you get it? Now you see this for what it really is? And the truth is, well, she does. But that's the question of the Lord is, what is this that you have done? The thing that she did, she thought was something else. She was not thinking about what the Lord had actually said. She was thinking, well, I'm being left out. I should know more. I need to see what's behind that curtain. Imaginary curtain. There's no real curtain. God is out in the open, clear. And, and honest, but she wasn't seeing it that way. Now, what is it? She knows what it is now. Now she gets it. So you see Adam's, or God's questions to Adam and God's question to Eve reflect a difference between willful sin and deceived sin. There is a difference there. Now, Adam's response recorded at verse 12 of Genesis 3, the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. He knew full well what they were doing, <laughs> okay? He was not deceived. He knew what they were doing. So when he's questioned about it by God rightly, he first blames Eve, the woman, and then he blames God, the woman you gave to be with me. And who is that? Well, that's everybody else in the whole world. <laughs> you know, at that time, it's just two of them. But still, Adam blames everybody else in the whole world before he can accept responsibility for his own action. Right? That's rebellion. And do you notice what he said? Well, she gave me of the fruit. You see what that means? He's implying that, well, he didn't even know 
where she got the fruit from. He didn't even know it was the, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is a lie. He was right there. The devil was talking to both of them. When he said, has the Lord really told you? You know, that's you plural, y'all. Y'all will not surely die. The Lord knows in the day that y'all eat of it, y'all will be like God's, knowing good and evil. That's what the devil says. It's in plural. He's talking to both of them. <laughs> he was right there. He knew this is a lie. He's still rebellious. He still thinks he can hide. You see? That's what this is pointing out to us. And this is the exact opposite of what we're hoping to talk about later. He clearly knew what he was doing and why he did it. Eve, on the other hand, Genesis 3 in verse 13, recorded her response after God asked, do you know what this is now? She does, because she said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. She's not blaming the serpent. She's stating a fact. Do you know what this is? Yes, I know what this is. It's this, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. She honestly confessed that she had been deceived and that by being deceived, she sinned. What does that mean? It means Eve was a bigger man than Adam. That's what it means. Eve was a bigger man than Adam. She owned it. She was honest. Okay? That's what we're getting at. She was honest. Honestly mistaken. And it cost a lot. It cost big time. But she was honest. She confessed. And her confession is every bit in harmony with what we uh, saw the Apostle Paul say in 2 Corinthians 11.3. He said, I'm afraid that as Eve was deceived by the cunning of Satan, your minds will be led astray. You know, that she saw it and acknowledged it after the fact that I got tricked. I was fooled. I was bamboozled. This was a lie, and I believed it. I was wrong. That's what she's saying by this confession here in Genesis 3.13. And that's exactly what we're talking about. That can happen to me today. I could do exactly the same thing. And if I don't believe that, then I'm open to it, even more open to it than I was already. That's, that's just a recipe for walking right into it. If you think, oh, no, no, that's not going to happen to me. I'm smarter than her. She's a woman, and I'm a man, and men are smarter. No, there's no, that's, the Bible says no such thing ever. <laughs> if you think that way, there's no question. You're just fodder for the devil. You are just ripe for the picking. You will be deceived instantly. Now, if you look over in the letter to the Hebrews, to continue the teaching of Paul, Hebrews 9, the truth is in the New Testament, not only at 1 Timothy 2, 13 and 14, but also in Hebrews 9 and in Hebrews 10, there is a concept of unintentional sin. There are those who sin knowing full well that they are sinning. That's open rebellion. But there are those who sin unintentionally, as in under false premises, being deceived, not realizing what they're doing. The New Testament introduces this idea as well as the old. And so I do want us to, you know, let's say we are going to understand this concept. Uh, we're not going to go into unintentional sins as its own study right now. I hope to do that later. But in Hebrews 9 and Hebrews 10, these are the verses. It's Hebrews 9, 7, where he says, only the high priest goes into the inner sanctuary, and only the high priest, uh, and he does it only once a year. That's Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. 
And when the Day of Atonement comes and he is going to go into that inner sanctuary, he does so not without taking blood. He takes blood, first of which he offers for himself, and then that which he offers for the unintentional sins of the people. And unintentional here is that idea of ignorant, unknowing. But the reason I'm putting this forward is to begin this concept, if you don't have it already, that in the, uh, even in the New Testament, it points back to the classic teaching of Leviticus, that sacrificial offerings are prescribed and uh, defined only for unintentional sins. In Hebrews 10, it's verses 26 and 27. If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. In other words, what he's saying there, if we go on sinning deliberately, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. What he's saying, what he means by this phrase is, we have gotten to the end of the list of prescribed offerings in Leviticus. There are no more offerings available for you. The thing that you have done, if it is deliberate, does not have a sacrifice available. There are no sacrifices available for those kinds of things. They're not prescribed in Leviticus. This is what he means when he says this. If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. We, we, we've gone through the list. We got to the end of the list. There's no more sacrifices, and we haven't addressed things that you've done intentionally. <laughs> That's because there are no sacrifices for intentional sins. There's only penalties. Penalties. Now, some of the penalties include offering sacrifices, but... They're not for forgiveness. They're penalties. And penalties go all the way up to death. And I do want to say this uh, about Hebrews 10, which is very often misunderstood. This particular statement of, of Paul uh, is very often misunderstood. People think that the meaning of this statement, you know, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. People think that this means somehow the, the sacrifice that Jesus made like exists in perpetuity and is somehow uh, fixed in between us and God. That you know, we would be condemned by God except that he doesn't see us. He sees the sacrifice of Jesus that's been put between us and him. That's utterly false. The Bible says no such thing. It's ridiculous. That's not in the scriptures. But that's what people believe. What is that? Well, that takes a lot of different names. I mean, there's continuous cleansing. There's, you know, Calvinism. There's, um, well, Gnosticism. There's a lot of different names for this idea that you are, you know, not actually being seen. You're being covered, hidden. And that's just not true. The blood of Jesus washes away sins. And he didn't die for us to continue in sin. He died that we may stop sinning. Any understanding of this, that as if what he's saying is, well, if you go on sinning deliberately, then the sacrifice of Jesus will be taken out of the way, and now you have God's direct uh, scrutiny on you, and you're going to be subject to, to, to being uh, judged now, whereas before you were sinning and you weren't going to be judged for it. The Bible teaches no such thing. That is straight error out of the theological seminaries. That's unbiblical. It's Calvinistic. It's just not true. So 
what we're really saying here is if we have the kind of sins that are intentional, that are deliberate, that we willingly engage in, knowing what we're doing, that means there's no sacrifice available. Instead, there's the fearful expectation of judgment and the fire that consumes the adversary. There's deliberate and there's unintentional. That's to say, that rebellious sin and that deceived sin. That's what it's talking about. All right. We're in 1 John chapter 1, speaking of understanding how we obtain forgiveness. We'll close in 1 John chapter 1. Let's talk about the full truth about sins which are intentional and uh, otherwise. We have in the fifth verse of the first chapter, I'm going to go for a ways here down through the first paragraph of the second because this actually fits together and needs to be said. This is the message we've heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin at all, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the satisfying sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we are in him. I love God when I keep his word, you see. I will make mistakes. If we say we have no sin at all, we're, we're deceiving ourselves. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. In the same way as, we, as he said earlier, that the blood of Jesus cleanses from all unrighteousness. I will make mistakes, but God has provided for that. We have an advocate, he said. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So what is my charge? My charge is press on to maturity. Whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected, finished out, you know, reached its final state. Meaning my love for God. I love God when I keep his commandments. My love for God is mature, reaches its fullness, its adulthood, when I'm keeping his word. It's what Jesus said, you know, uh, if you abide in my word, then you are truly my disciples, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free, in John 8. So 1 John, I think, provides all the answers that we need about this, that, you know, there's more than one kind of sin. James acknowledges this in, in his fifth chapter, and John acknowledges this in his fifth chapter in the, of his first letter. And yet, all sin has the same remedy. Forgiveness comes in Christ Jesus when we confess that. When we come clean, our mother Eve confessed these things, and we ought to be so honest with ourselves as well, and so honest with our God if we wish to be forgiven. But as John said, and I would emphasize that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins if we confess them. First, he's faithful as in we can count on him to forgive if we 
repent. He will. God is better at forgiveness than we are. He can forgive and forget. And He wants us to be reconciled. He wants me to come back to Him and to be right with Him. And He is just to forgive. He has already dealt with the problems of equilibrium in the universe <laughs> by giving His Son Jesus. It is right for Him to do what He will do. People think, well, that's not fair. That's not the way it should be. You know, that's not up to you. God's way is just. It's our way that is unjust. See Ezekiel 18. He will forgive, and he will forgive if you will repent. So that's the appeal today. If you believe in God, if you believe in his son Jesus, if you realize your guilt before God, repent. If you are not a Christian, become a Christian. Get for yourself this forgiveness that comes through the blood of Christ by the way that he prescribed, which is repent, everyone, and be baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins, Acts 2 and verse 38. It's the same prescription that the Lord gave in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and it's the prescription that has been uh, held forth in the Bible ever since these 2,000 years. We have water prepared that you might be buried in baptism if that is your need. Today, if you're a Christian and haven't lived right, repent and pray God for forgiveness. But let us pray with you too because we need help, we need encouragement, and we might be able to help you. If you need our prayers today, if you need to be baptized, please let the need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.